Welcome listeners. I'm Miriam Merrill, Chair of the Physical Education Department and the Director of Pomona Pitzer Athletics. We are so excited to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Title IX. For those of you who don't know, Title IX is the landmark education amendment of 1972 that prohibits sex discrimination in any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. We're so excited because Pomona Pitzer is highlighting our own implementation of Title IX with a series of events and programs, including a three-part docu-series of conversations with various students, alumni, and coaches who played an integral role in Title IX here on campus. I'm joined today by Onetta Brooks, Pomona class of 1974, and we are super excited to have her here. Onetta launched her sports career at Pomona College playing basketball for four years, volleyball for three years, and she went out for track and field once. <laughs> for those of you who may not know, track and field is actually my sport, so I'm glad you at least had a taste. <laughs> Annetta Brooks was inducted into the Athletic Hall of Fame in 1984 and currently serves on the Pomona College Board of Trustees. Welcome, Onetta. Thank you, Miriam. It's, I'm honored to be here and at least to have one semester of track and field to have something in common with you. Absolutely. <laughs> So as a licensed minister, Reverend Brooks, Brooks earned a Master's of Divinity from San Francisco Theological Seminary and a Master's of Public Administration from Cal State Dominguez Hills. She worked professionally for various aerospace companies as a program manager and system software engineer for 34 years. In volleyball while at Pomona, she was a powerful hitter and covered a lot of the court. In basketball, she was a very quick and jumped so well, she always defended against the opponent's tallest player. You all should know is she's not 6'5", so she must have had a pretty high vertical. According to the 1984 Hall of Fame program, Annetta played during an era of few rewards and many trials for female athletes. Women provided their own equipment, usually by making the uniforms and buying their own shoes. Women were not eligible for letter awards, and there were no possibilities of recognition through all conference selections or through regional or national championships. Female athletes at Pomona Pitzer were relegated to the women's gym, nostalgic old Renwick, and did not have the benefit of weight rooms, training facilities, or other locker and shower areas. Annetta, we are really looking forward to hearing your story. All right, so let's get started. So I'd like to hear a little bit about your experience. So the first question I have for you is if you could tell us a little bit more about your experiences as a Pomona Pitzer student athlete. And if you want to share some of your favorite memories, feel free to do that too. Well, great, great memories. You know, I uh, came, as it says, in 1970 to 74, and I really came on an academic scholarship, and I really had no idea I was an athlete or to participate. Uh, but my memories, um, it's true in my own neighborhood, we would play in the streets and climb the trees and sometimes run and chase um, trains and jump on them, those kind of things. But when I came to Pomona uh, and played with the Pomona pitcher team, my greatest memories are, wait a minute, green manure sheets when we went to a game at San Luis Obispo. I will say my last basketball game was, of course, the streaker that came through the game in Memorial Gym. During the time, the only game my mother came to watch me. Oh, my. And so that was a memorable moment for her, too. <laughs> um, but more importantly, what I do in seriousness with all of that is connections and community. Uh, there were so many life lessons for me. And the team working together, depending on our various skills and our gifts, just working together, um, realizing eventually that we all succeed when each person is allowed to have an opportunity. So those are my memories that most importantly stick out um, that have really been involved in a lifetime, a lifelong experience so far. That's awesome. You know, that is certainly the same sentiment that a lot of student athletes still talk about. So it's Really great to hear that that was a large part of your experience here as well. So now let's let's move into practice, right? So what was a typical team practice or for volleyball uh, and basketball? What I remember uh, for basketball since I start out, you would come in, do a few laps around the court, uh, some stretching, passing the ball to one another, uh, and kind of I think that V shape where you would run and shoot 
in the basket and kind of do opposites. Uh, that was my most experience before we came on. And sometimes you would run outside and on your own time. Now, volleyball was special. And I, I was thinking about this particularly because, granted, we would start off with stretches and, you know, you would jump and sometimes against the net go pair off and go by and jump and touch your other partners uh, on the opposite side's uh, palms just and keep jumping. But the most important part was diving on the floor without thinking about it. That the coach would throw the ball, you would dive and run, and you would dive on the floor with your knee pads and roll over and get up. And the intention was, don't think about it, just do it. And I think about that now because I would think so hard and what I would hurt. But at that time, I didn't do, do those. So those were some of the typical uh, experiences I remember in warm up. Yeah, that's great. Um, I certainly would be concerned about <laughs> diving on the floor. So especially the stories I've heard about the gym floor, right? It's yes. uh, very different than the floors that we have now. But we'll get into a little bit about uh, facilities and, and stuff like that in a bit. You know, I, one of the things uh, that folks may know is we are actually – uh, have a partnership with East Bay and Nike, and so hmm. our student athletes benefit from that with gear, right? Uh, so what I'm interested in hearing is, what was gear like for you back <laughs> in those days? Did we have gear other than the balls or whatever? <laughs> well, what I do remember for volleyball in the initial couple years is we made our own shorts, and somehow there was a top that had a number, and I don't know if that was just something left over, but my experience, and of course you had to buy your own shoes, and um, I think the knee pads maybe have been provided. So all I recall is um, those were really kind of, on, we were on our own the first couple of years when I came in 70. Eventually, maybe um, the shorts later on or, or a few things were provided, but I don't remember very many things. Definitely had to buy your own athletic shoes. Mm -hmm. And they were not Nike. I'm just going to say. <laughs> right. And that actually, even the 90s, so me, late 90s, early 2000s, that was part of my experience doing track and field at the University of Cincinnati is we had to provide our own practice gear. Yes, we had uniforms, but, mm -hmm. you know, and now, you know, fast forward to 2021, we have students who are provided practice gear, right? Not only uniforms and shoes and all of that. Um, so it's interesting how there's been this kind of progression of, of mm -hmm. how, you know, the institution institutions are supporting uh, yeah. student athletes and laundry we had to do our own mm. laundry so to speak uh, so we could come back fresh the next time i think towels may have been provided but sure i'm just saying yeah <laughs> so all the student athletes out there th know that you have it well right <laughs> exactly <laughs> yes so i want to talk a little bit about fem female role models mm -hmm. so for me um being the youngest of four um and my older sister playing all the sports volleyball basketball um, in softball, I really would sit in the stands and watch her and really felt like, oh, this is something I could do. Sports is natural. Uh, for you, who are some of those role models that you think about um, back in the days who uh, you looked up to? Mm -hmm. Mostly were from a distance. I mean, I was aware of Althea Gibson, and of course, that was tennis, and I didn't participate, or Billie Jean King, but of course, you know, a lot of running for women was so... Uh, was known so speed track and field so was it um, Wilma Rudolph was uh, a name that would come up but very few women because again you know you would watch uh, baseball to hear uh, a lot of the male sports but very little in my day uh, was females so it's really just what you would see on let's just say at this point unnamed for me because that was really not something women uh, and the girls were encouraged to participate in. That's great. Yeah, some of the female role models that you named are, are greats. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about the people in physical education? You know, I like to think that mm. I try to make an impact on the student athletes, <laughs> right? So those in physical education athletics, was there anyone who was especially Im impactful in your life? Absolutely. Number one, Nancy Breitenstein was my uh, coach. Breitenstein. And uh, it was the first time, uh, as she introduced herself, it was at Simpsonville, Simpsonville Kentucky. And as when I first entered, I came to a volleyball game to watch some of my other colleagues, and I was in the stand. And she approached me and pointed out about, you need to come to basketball practice for the next season. I said, me? What? Okay. All right. So I came. So what I appreciate about her is that she was a friend of colleagues. She was very stern about uh, a routine, was very encouraging, but so many 
life it, lessons came from that. When you made a mistake, she would correct. Sometimes she would tell me that I, um, I wouldn't correct you, or she says, I've already know, I know you're in your head already doing it, so I really would just kind of come back lightly and follow up. But I think, clearly Nancy was it, I think the most important experience for me is that she wanted, yes, to win, but it was the lesson in how you played. And I remember in volleyball when I was um, coming to myself to begin to realize I was kind of being named, is being on the back row against a Cal State Long Beach team. And I was the center, and there was a tall person, and they kept spiking the ball to me. And I missed it a couple of times. And coach would not let me leave. She kept me in that position, and she said, they're psyching you, pay attention, and again, shake it off. And eventually, by the third time, I was able to return it, and, you know, you get to rotate, and we had the ball. And the truth about it, after that, they left me alone. Mm. You know, it's like, it's, again, that lesson of just keep going. Uh, don't get down on yourself. So um, I still communicate with her periodically. We'll send her a card and say happy birthday, but definitely Nancy Bernstein. That's great. You know, and it, it, it always really is impactful to have, you know, those in your lives who kind of push mm -hmm. you through those places of discomfort when you're just like, I don't know if I can do it. And then there are people behind you who say, you can. Absolutely. So that's great to hear about her. Absolutely. But I also just add, one of the cheerleaders, I, I though I didn't play tennis, I just realized is that uh, Ann Badges was um, also the director and whatever, and she was into tennis, and she would just be on the sidelines and continuing to encourage. So it was always great to have encouragers. And I will just lift up her. Absolutely. I've had a chance to meet with her, mm -hmm. and I could absolutely listen to her stories all day long. Yeah. All right. So I want to talk a little bit more about Title IX. Mm -hmm. So when you were a college student here, what did you know about Title IX and its passage, and, and what did it mean for women's opportunities in, in athletics? Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, very little. And I say that because although I know – the coaches and some of the students who had come from other schools knew about it. For me, it was, um, well, it was very clear, obviously, being in Renwick and playing and, and having to do your, you know, provide your own clothes. Uh, it was always understood that, obviously, male sports versus female sports, uh, you know, male sports was going to have that attention. And yet, um, back in that time, uh, there was just avocation for it, but yet it wasn't really talked about. In my high school, because I wasn't an athlete, I mean, we would play six-on-six six basketball, that kind of a concept wasn't talked about. And yet at the same time, uh, I didn't know much about it. And yet some of the students would um, would label, you know, would have more discussions about it than I did. Mm -hmm. But, you know, always trying to have equal, if you want to, or equal access male and female locker rooms and all the equipment. It was just something for me that I knew would take time. Um, and I'm just so grateful that it eventually has um, come a long way since that up, since my time here. Mm -hmm. You know, and I identify with that. That is, you know, very much my story too. So I think while I was in it, so University of Cincinnati added women's track and field as a way to, you know, increase the numbers of, of women participating in athletics. Um, and so I, I think I joined maybe uh, women's track and field had been on campus three years, maybe. Right. OK. And so I remember, you know, being a part of the team, but not really understanding the importance or the role of Title IX in, in me having this opportunity. But it wasn't until later graduating kind of uh, now working in administrative administration um, and knowing just the importance of Title IX and, and its impact, because without it. Right. I would not have been a track and field member at mm -hmm. University of Cincinnati. So I think I, I really identify with your, your thoughts about in the moment, right? It just really wasn't part of the conversation, but kind of later on. Yeah. And the good news is that even now you see a progression where even more males appreciate and understand that. You know, it mm -hmm. used to be back in the day mm -hmm. that when you would play co-ed sports, uh, there was this kind of ranking, the, uh, what is it, Women had certain kind of handicap numbers if you're going to have those sure. games, and it's just come a long way, so that's a positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is part of the reason why we're doing this, right, is so that people can understand where Title IX has impacted people. So, again, we appreciate you being a part. Thank you. So, as we know, college athletics is only a small portion of our lives, right? 
Um, so how did you use lessons learned from your time as a student athlete at Pomona Pitzer to better apply yourself to both the workforce and life in the future? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I am grateful that I learned the lessons at Pomona by playing. I didn't realize the strategies and that sense of community. Granted, we were here for the academics and, and we would have our challenges of school. We all came from various places thinking we were the brightest in our class and we wanted to do well. But there's still something coming uh, in playing and being at Pomona, uh, negotiating with one another when you're the top of whatever your class. But when you're playing athletics, everyone's spot is important, but there's some give and some take and how to strategize in what you do well. And yet, you can't be the center of attention all the time. How important it is in team sport to make sure you're your other your co-player is enhanced too to be supportive. I will just say the best instances for me, um, because I did go out afterwards and be work in an aerospace defense contractor, primarily male predominant um, uh, environment. There was a hierarchy. I was never in the military, but I was a contractor, and obviously many of us were males. And I have learned that I was a good. Let's get things done. I'm an implementer. I got it, I, I translate. But the goal is we have to deliver some software or some products to our customer, how to move through that. And what it allowed me, I learned later, as I was getting promotions, when I would lead predominantly male with PhDs um, of projects for the males, having to gain that respect and navigate. But at the same time I was told is that there were always a few women who were a little bit shy about it. And my role was, again, let me bring out the best of you. Let me, again, include you. Um, and again, to make sure we all have respect. And of course, at that time, uh, being a black female navigating predominantly white spaces, particularly male, how to, you know, eventually it's always special when two little small things happen. And my, my teamwork, which was so diverse uh, at the time, one, whenever a male eventually realizes to invite you to the table and they move over because they understand it's your role. And I, I was very clear that you just keep doing what you're doing and you were invited to the table. But more importantly, when you're out with your team that are predominantly male and you go to the restaurant and after the, what is it, the, the waiter gives the check to the male thinking it's for them and they just turn and say, no, she's, she's paying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. she's a leader. So I think what I would say is that if I had not had that experience here with team and getting a certain confidence uh, of myself uh, and b being able to apply it in my workplace, you know, things would have been different. So I, I use that there. That's and obviously even in my church roles, that's a whole other thing, the hierarchy and that, di you know, that dynamic. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that sense of confidence I, I totally agree with, right, is like when you're on the court, you kind of learn how to work with other people and then it just translates to the same thing. You're just not you don't have a ball in your hand, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in your eyes, um, how have women's sports changed since you were at Pomona Pitzer student athlete? And to what extent has there been progress towards equity in your eyes? Well, clearly space and gyms and, and equipment, uh, being able to have access that you will consider women's locker rooms and uh, e um, being able to do have someone launder, you know, launder your, your, your uniforms or shoes. And so those spaces have changed. And I think sometimes we take it for granted, but it's come along and I can see that, that, that sense of equity coming along. Also, um, pay, I will just say, if those who are professional, mm -hmm. there's still an inequity there. And I think we still have a long way to go. But, you know, I will look at um, WNBA now and, and other sports where women are, being able to participate, I think that's important. Um, so that's changed. And I think there are, we've had some athletes and named persons who've made some records, which is very important here at Pomona Pitzer uh, Sports. But I do recall, and coming back, uh, maybe about 20 some odd years later, as I said, from to a pickup game uh, to see some Pomona students. Uh, and play, and, and it was male and female, it was a co-ed game. But what I was most impressed with is how, again, the 
I talk about the, the males, when we would choose people, they wouldn't look at the playing with the girls as handicapped. Mm. And that, uh, you know, the scores, when you would count, that it was really distributed. We played full court. And even as an aging person at the time, I was able to play. And the only thing for a moment, one g- person who was guarding me, it's assumed because I was a little older that I wouldn't, he wouldn't need to guard me too long. And then I, he found out he did. <laughs> so I think um, that was important that there's an, a, a respect mm-hmm. and I can see that change. And a lot of times when I've come to the games, I have seen sometimes more people coming to the women's game and mm-hmm. cheering to see it more exciting um, than sometimes the males. Let me knock on woods on those games. So I think the respect um, and taking it very seriously. And I just look forward in the future when the, the pay is always equitable. That would be wonderful. So the next question is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, as a black woman, I'm always interested in hearing about the experience of others. So can you talk about your experience as a black student athlete playing for Pomona Pitzer uh, back in the day and in the 1970s? Yeah. Well, the thing I will acknowledge is that um, I did grow up in the Watts area in Los Angeles. Um, and even though there was levels of diversity and I clearly was on academics and actually one of my math teachers was the infamous George McKenna who is known to have been the former principal of Washington High School and you know a tough little cookie from New Orleans but encouraging but what I mean by that is in there was an encouragement for uh, many students uh, to go to college I am clearly the first in my uh, family to have come to a private residential college and so there was, you know, people take pride in that. And so there's that responsibility. So coming to Pomona College, which in my time was a predominantly white college, liberal arts college, but having a good reputation um, was important. And the fact it was residential, which meant I had to live on campus. Mm-hmm. And so I did feel the pressure, again, of doing well, because there was, again, as a second class of 10% black students admitted, um, a variety of persons, including professors and staff, were always wanting, were, were looking and paying attention to make sure that we were performing well so that they could say that we didn't am- impact or affect the scores or uh, the reputation of the college. So I felt that pressure. So the goal was to do well. Most importantly, I wanted to do well myself because I was here and make my family proud. So sports for me was the balance, a way to release. To be working, on, uh, to be participating on a team with a diverse group of folks of all kind of ethnic backgrounds, and to have a coach from Simpsonville, Kentucky, uh, was it's important. But having those lessons was important to me to allow me to balance out um, somehow the pressures of the academics with the community that I would have on the team. And the, I call it the intimacy uh, of the residential life. And I remember uh, President Gabby alluding to that a couple weeks ago when she was doing the Milken Institute. There is a certain intimacy mm-hmm. uh, that comes when you're playing ball together. And for me, help balancing, whether they were uh, API or um, what or whatever, is that we were on a team and we worked together. And I still have some of those relationships now. Um, uh, and participated afterwards, even in some alumni games and sometimes on playing beach volleyball, breathing very hard because, you know, two, oh two, two on two is a very hard game. Mm-hmm. But I think that was important to me. So I think um, it made a difference. I think it allowed people who came from different backgrounds who needed to get beyond the TV or the stories to realize as we're interacting and getting to know one another and hearing each other's stories that um, that that race, that they were able to ask questions and connect beyond race, which is important. Absolutely. Yeah, sport does bring people together and often allows you to kind of take off whatever identities that you may have and you can just be in the moment and play and succeed, right? Um, so I really appreciate that about sport. It's definitely that's about the content of your character. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, so I talked about it before. So I want to revisit Renwick Gym. Uh, so what do you remember about the gym? Um, for those of you who don't know, the gym was built in 1918 and was originally intended uh, to be barracks for student soldiers during World War I. Uh, it was later redesigned uh, into the women's gym for physical education and athletics. 
So tell us a little bit about the gym, what you remember, and uh, if you want to add in a story about a woodpecker or pigeons or bees, feel free to. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can definitely talk about the holes, the woodpecker holes, and again, the pigeons, because you would find droppings. So to be in such a prestigious <laughs> mm -hmm. residential college and see this gym for the women was kind of an eye opener. And I would say, I could even say in my own neighborhood, where I grew up, I've seen better. So uh, it was um, an awakening. And I think it was probably for my own first year that I think uh, the women played practice in that gym before coming later on to, which was a vocal a, a memorial gym. So I think it was a humbling place, but I think it always, in some regards, was an equalizer that whatever your, you know, sometimes we have perceptions of what's the best. And, but the reality is it was an opportunity to put down your, your biases about perfect and prejudice, the, the more glamorous place to play. And eventually as people just play. So yeah, it had that, that reputation. And I remember intramural, intramural games and the guys or whatever, but it was still humbling yet a connecting place. And I'm glad it's gone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've also heard it was in a, uh, a movie, right? I can't remember which one. Ann Badges was telling me a story, and I cannot remember. For she the would have the best it. memory about that. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. So, so clearly, Renwick Gym is <laughs> nothing like this new building that we're going to have here. So that's that's Less good. to say, I didn't dream about it last night. <laughs> good to know. Good to know. It's been really great to chat with you this afternoon. So I've got one question that I want to leave you with. Um, is there anything that you want to share with our current student athletes or anything that you want to make sure that they know? One thing I must recall is that, um, and I'll be honest, when I came to Pomona College, I was not probably aware of the Athletic Hall of Fame. And, and I wasn't really considering being an athlete in sports. The good part of it is just by participating and learning and just saying yes um, and connecting with folks, um, I grew and it gave me life lessons and opportunities to create, you know, to gather my confidence that, that people were important in those lifetime relationships, that I continue to use it, I continue to mirror it. The, be the Benny, if you want to call it, was to receive a call 10 years after graduation from um, Nancy Bridenstine saying I had been inducted into the Hall of Fame. And I was surprised. And yet what was important, it's, it was, it's good to know that you can come and play and be all of who you are without having to pay attention to the stats. And that's not the only thing. It really is about the relationships and uh, the importance of that, and it transformed my life. And so what I really do say uh, to other and our current athletes, don't worry about the numbers, uh, who sees you, uh, just play from your heart. And at the same time, remember, in life as I learned one game when my head got real big, that I was given the ball and would make baskets the first half of the game. But what I learned the second half of the game when I was past the ball and I would take a shot, I made no points. I learned that we're all in this together and that sometimes rather than take that last shot in life, you pass it to someone else. And as we uh, do that, we all benefit from it. So That's great. So sometimes don't take the last shot, pass it to someone else. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Onetta, for joining us today. We are so grateful for your time and grateful to you for paving the way for our current student athletes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in today. Please look for our other programs and events celebrating Pomona Pitzer's 50 years of Title IX. We'll see you soon. <laughs>